Who are our greatest presidents? What lessons can the modern day business leader learn from our 46 chiefs of state? Find out in this podcast series with Tom Fox and Richard Loomis to delve into the great and not so great presidents to mine their successes and failures for today's business executive. Richard Lummis, I'm here with Tom Fox for another discussion on how to improve our leadership skills. We believe leadership is a skill which can be improved with study of both good and bad practices, and we try to draw interesting examples from many sources, including history, fiction, film, and business writing. Welcome back, Tom. Thank you, Richard. Today's discussion is part of our series on presidents of the United States. The next few episodes, we'll be discussing presidents who have pretty much been forgotten. Rutherford B. Hayes, our 19th president, who served 1877 to 1881, is a case in point. He was born 1822 in Delaware, Ohio. His father had been a storekeeper in Vermont before moving to Ohio, and he died 10 weeks before Rutherford was born, leaving him to be raised by his mother. He attended common schools in Ohio, then went to a Methodist seminary for a year. After another year in a preparatory school in Connecticut, he went to Kenyon College in Ohio. He graduated in 1842 as a valedictorian and briefly read law in Ohio before going to Harvard Law School. He graduated from there in 1845 and began practicing law in Sandusky, Ohio. He moved to Cincinnati where he met and married Lucy Webb, who was a Methodist teetotaler and abolitionist. He became prominent mainly as a criminal defense attorney, defending slaves who'd escaped to Ohio and were accused under the Fugitive Slave Act. His first elected political office was a solicitor of the city of Cincinnati, and he was elected in 1859 and then lost the election in 1861 when Cincinnati turned against the Republicans in favor of Democrats and know-nothings. He joined the 23rd Regiment of Ohio Volunteer Infantry and was promoted to major. He later referred to the Civil War as his golden years. He was wounded four times, had numerous horses shot out from under him, and ended the war as a brevet major general. While he was serving in the Army, he was elected to Congress in 1864. In Congress, he supported the 14th Amendment, the Civil Rights Act of 1866, and the Reconstruction Acts. Although he was re-elected to Congress in 1866, he resigned in 1867 to run for governor of Ohio. He narrowly won and was re-elected in 1869. He chose not to run in 1872, but following financial reverses from the Panic of 1873, he ran again in 1875 and became the first three-term governor of Ohio. He's nominated for president in 1876 by the Republicans as a compromise candidate, and the election was one of the most contentious in American history. I think that's a good point for us to start our discussion, Tom, with that with that election. Well, that's, that was a great summary, Richard, and I really enjoyed researching the presidents that we're going to, to talk about over the next few podcasts. And there were a few themes that I'd like to really throw out at the start of this one that perhaps we can reflect on throughout these series of presidents. The first one is that I guess I, if I had known this, I'd certainly forgotten it, but there's nothing new in American politics. And uh, as bad as you think things may be at any one point in time, we were both obviously alive when federal troops were uh, actually sandbagged around the Capitol. That was a pretty contentious time, but the uh, disputed election of 1876 and indeed the Compromise of 1876 may have been one of, except for the Civil War, one of the greatest potential powder kegs in American history, at least in electoral politics. The, uh, the situation was that uh, the uh, candidate, Mr. Tilden, he had won by, or at least was ahead by, 19 electoral votes. There were three states whose votes were in dispute, South Carolina, Florida, and Louisiana. The Republicans claimed that those states had been won by Republicans. Oregon at that time, which was a state, had three electors, and one of their le- electors was disqualified. So the three electors that had been uh, selected for Hayes of the three from Oregon, one had to withdraw, so there ne- he needed 20 votes, and he had to win all 20 votes from the disputed election. There was really no apparent compromise that could be made. It was either going to be Tilden or uh, Hayes, and Congress decided that an electoral commission would be appointed. Decided to punt. Punt. <laughs> like I said, nothing new. They appointed a committee, and the committee was to be seven Democrats, seven Republicans, and one nonpartisan. And in the Democrats, the Democrats, in a 
brilliant tactical move that completely backfired on them. Appointed one of the appointed rather the uh, the independent to a seat, a Democratic seat in the Senate, thinking this would influence him. It did. He probably resigned from the commission. <laughs> and so his replacement was a Republican, giving the Republicans eight, a majority of eight to seven. And not surprisingly, they, they, their votes took or uh, held firm, and the Electoral Commission awarded the election to Ruth R. Hayes. But that really doesn't tell the story, I don't think, which is the compromise that occurred. And literally, it was worked out, I believe, the weekend before the inauguration, if not the day before the inauguration, I think in the Hay House, perhaps. Yeah, the, uh, the election was decided, what, two days before the right. before inauguration day. Exactly. Inauguration day fell on us. The date for inauguration fell on a Sunday, and they, uh, they were not going to have a public ceremony on a Sunday. So that was scheduled for Monday, but uh, just to make sure nothing had transpired between Saturday and Monday, he was sworn in privately in the White House, Hayes was. But the, the compromise of 1876, I think, was necessary for healing of the United States. I recognize that, that it led to, or at least ended, the robust nature of Reconstruction, the robust nature of federal intervention in elections in the South, and the protection of civil rights. But at some point, the country was either going to have to come back together in some way. Reconstruction could have lasted 50 years if, uh, if the former radical Republicans wanted to have, uh, have the South totally reconstructed. And as I recall, the compromise allowed Hayes to be elected president. It ended informally Reconstruction, which Hayes then did formally end. It ended the robust nature of the federal election protections for minorities. The other thing that I recall from my university days was there was a series of other parts to the uh, compromise which really in- integrated true Southerners and even unreconstructed Southerners back into the federal government. So, for instance, uh, judicial appointment to the Supreme Court was promised to be a Southerner and that they would engage, the federal government would engage in a more road building and bridge building infrastructure improvement, I guess we would call it today, in the South. Very little money had been spent on the South during Reconstruction. So it was really an attempt to to bring the country back together. And a Southerner would be appointed to the cabinet. And the cabinet, yes. And a Southerner was appointed to the cabinet. It truly was a compromise. The South did get, I think they basically won. (laughs) They <laughs> got what they wanted. We won, as we say. Nevertheless, I think it was important for the country, but I did want to see if you had a different view on it. Was the compromise necessary or were even of the components of it? Did you think it went too far? Yeah, I do have a slightly different view, but first I'd like to point out how incredibly engaged the electorate was during this period. This election, 82.6% of the eligible voters turned out and voted. And of that, Tilden won the popular vote by 250,000, which was almost a 3% margin. So it's quite striking that when he lost the election, there wasn't as much carping as there has been about Donald Trump's election in particular. But as for Reconstruction, one of the things that struck me was that the governments of Louisiana and South Carolina in particular really were dependent on federal military support to exist. They were utterly unreconstructed in psychological terms. And the end of that, Jim Crow really didn't get strong for another 15, 20 years, but it really paved the way for Jim Crow. And I think it was, I don't think there's a good way out of it after a civil war. This was probably as good a way as any. It was peaceful, and but it certainly had the effect of disenfranchising blacks in the Deep South for many years. And that's a pretty high price. Yeah, and that really leads to the first general topic of Hayes' presidency, around leadership that I wanted to explore with you, and it is exactly that, the end of Reconstruction. Was it it inevitable, just looking at the cost to maintain federal troops in the South, both the financial cost, the resource cost, but also the psychological cost, one, to be a a country or a part of a country that is still boarding troops in in a a conquered part of the country— And the second part, was there ever going to be any reconciliation, a true reconciliation, without political equality and without simply the troops being moved? And I had not really focused on the cost as much until I prepared for this episode, the financial cost, the resource cost, and really the cost to the North 
of the psychological cost of having to have sons and husbands and brothers literally in the South for years on end. Reconstruction at this point had been, so that's 11 years. And there's still widespread sentiment in the United States at this time period against a standing army of any kind, really. And instead, you not only had a standing army, it was an occupation army of part of your country. So it was divisive. The, uh, there had been a suppression of the Klan somewhat, <laughs> and with other appropriations, it's something called the Enforcement Act, the federal government was able to provide some protection and some civil rights, protection of civil rights. All of those ended, and unfortunately, we obviously paid the price for that as a country, uh, Some would say to the Civil Rights Act, some would say we're still paying that price today, but I think your analysis is correct. There was no good way out of this, and I don't know what, if we'd had Reconstruction for another 50 years and the South had been occupied, if they'd broken up the large estates, if they'd gone back to the uh, levelers and diggers from English, English history, would that have made a difference? I don't know. It would be a much different country, though. It certainly would, and I don't think it would be a united one. But whatever Hayes' role in there, and I guess where I come down on leadership is that he took really the either the best of the worst decisions or kind of the least worst decision that he could have made. But once again, we have to acknowledge that it did disenfranchise the African-American community throughout the South for multiple generations. Yeah. One of his mottos was, he serves his party best who serves his country best. And I think that kind of summed up his presidency. So aside from the issue of the compromise and how he became president in the first place, what did you think of his behavior once he was president? We both were aware of the Credit Mobilier scandal, and uh, we talked about that in our podcast about President Grant. What I had not really understood or fully appreciated was how ingrained and endemic corruption was. And not simply the political process, but in the political spoils. And in both parties, absolutely correct. And I remember being taught that civil service reform was this enlightenment intellectual light bulb that went off in the collective head of America. And they just said, well, we're going to have a professional governmental service. And so we did. Well, it wasn't quite true. Quite that clean. Quite that clean. And civil service reform was a huge issue. And it was a huge problem. And probably during the war, it was not as important as winning the war was. Certainly the presidency of Andrew Johnson was not one of the premier or top issues. But after the conclusion of the Civil War and uh, the Grant presidency, I think corruption became a very important issue. And here, I think we have to credit Hayes' leadership. He aggressively attempted civil service reforms. He appointed people to his cabinet who were based, the selections were based on merit, which amazingly enough was considered an innovation at that point, not just a political payoff. We're going to talk about at length with Chester Arthur, the uh, Port of New York, because um, that turned out to be actually one of the most corrupt appointments. Not That's not right. Corrupt offices in the United States. The appointment, I don't think we could say was corrupt, but the all state appointments are within a state were controlled by the senior senator of that state. And Senator Conkling from um, New York placed uh, Chester A. Arthur, who later became president, in the role as uh, commissioner of the Port of New York. I was actually stunned to read that his salary exceeded over $800,000 in today's money from the overages he received. That actually wasn't all salary. Some of that was percentage cut. Yeah, yeah. The fines levied. No, that's what I meant, that it was actually, his salary, I think, was 35000 of that. It was uh, really interesting. But civil service reform, Hayes went after that. He also, the post office, uh, amazingly enough, uh, an organ that we may not, we certainly don't think of corruption around the post office, but it was apparently as corrupt. And so he went after the Port of New York quite aggressively. He wasn't as successful as uh, he wanted to be. And this was the first place I had seen the name of Theodore Roosevelt in a political tract was around this issue. And so civil service reforms, I have to give Hayes high credit for leadership on this. And your quotation of his phrase, he who serves his party best serves his country best, is absolutely correct. And Hayes really believed that going forward. Yeah, the, I think that was Theodore's father who was involved in that, too. There was a couple of other areas from his uh, presidency that I wanted to highlight. Uh, we didn't have, we're going to an era that would seem to be more focused on domestic politics, but we had a couple of foreign policy issues that I thought Hayes was uh, quite innovative and leader, leadership qualities shown. The first was 
He brokered a settlement in the Paraguayan War in a brutal war that happened in South America that not too many people, or at least Americans, I think, are very familiar with. Second, he diffused a border crisis with Mexico. There had been ongoing raids literally across the border. The the Texicans and our forefathers were still being harassed by Mexican banditos and perhaps we probably were giving out as good as they got <laughs> when they went across the border to look for lost cattle. The border crisis continued, and President Hayes was able to defuse that crisis by working out um, foreign policy agreements directly with the Mexican government. And then uh, immigration. And I guess this is another aha moment that, once again, I should have realized nothing is new in American politics. And uh, the immigration, we may be a immig- nation of immigrants, but the immigration issue has been with us literally since the start of the, re- the Republic. And in the 1830s to 1850s, it was Irish in New York and Boston. And after the Civil War, it was Chinese. And I was shocked to, to read that the U.S. passed a law that actually would have prevented Chinese immigration until, I think, eight, 1948. So that would have been 60 years of immigration ban. The immigration issues bubbled up, whether they were based on race, whether it was based on economics. It was a variety of issues. Chinese are well known for having contributed to the building of the Transcontinental Railroad and in San Francisco and in the West Coast. And there were very significant and, and severe issues around that at that time. Yeah, the, there were riots in San Francisco and other places in California. As usual, the immigrants were accused of depressing the wages of Native American workers, which sounds depressingly familiar, (laughs) but there you have it. There was even a third party called the Working Man's Party that formed, and their sole platform plank was suppression of Chinese immigration. So it was that kind of issue at the time. Hayes actually vetoed the the Chinese Exclusion Act. It subsequently passed and was signed by Arthur. But the reason he vetoed it was not that he disagreed with it. It was that it violated a treaty that was in place with China. That's kind of... The a couple of other things bubbled up for me, Richard. The first was the Great Railroad Strike of 1877. This turned out to be, I thought, a fairly short affair, although incredibly violent. Basically, two weeks in July of 1877, railroad men across the Midwest I would say from Chicago down to St. Louis, rioted, first of all, struck their employers, then rioted. Hayes called out federal troops to suppress the riots. At this point, there were no casualties between the strikers and the federal troops, although there were significant casualties between strikers and state militia. Hayes was uneasy about this for two reasons. One, he didn't. He wasn't sure that he had the authority to call out federal troops to protect a largely private enterprise. And then he was really concerned about the, the real reason for the strikes. And I thought it was very prescient that he said the strikes have been t- put down by force, but now for the real remedy. Can't something be done by education of strikers, by judicious control of capitalists, by wise general policy to end or diminish the evil? The railroad strikers, as a rule, are good men, sober, intelligent, and industrious. And it really spoke to, I think, a level of understanding that there are a lot more economic issues here that need to be not only un- unpacked, but everyone is going to have to work on a compromise here to try to move forward. And unfortunately, this presaged some very dramatic strikes up and through the Gilded Age. Yeah, and um, up until the Pullman strike, which we'll be discussing later. But I did think it was interesting. The role of the state militia at the time was still quite strong. They opened fire on strikers in several cases. But in general, I think the public correctly blamed the railroads for their treatment of workers as making the strike all but inevitable. And it was one of the, the railroads were one of the first times, I think, that we saw this amalgamation of corporate power that we're again seeing. <laughs> Once again, <laughs> nothing new. Did but, something uh, change or did yeah. I wake up? Yeah, but, but it's, it's an interesting time. So maybe I could uh, conclude with three general thoughts and maybe get your thoughts on them as well, Richard. Obviously, we talked about the motto, he who serves his party best, serves his country best. But there were a couple of other things that struck me about Hayes. One was his really non-judicious use of the veto. One might even say ruthless use. He was not afraid to veto laws, and he was not afraid to veto laws that became where his veto was overridden. So he, and perhaps this surprised me as much as anything, was his use of or reclaiming of executive power. When I thought about it in terms of the arc of history from, I can remember as a teenager, my father telling me that the radical Republicans, what they really wanted to do was move us from a republic to a parliamentary form of government. 
And I'm not sure I really ever bought into that in any way. But the legislative branch did seem to take a large measure of control, if not during the Civil War, after Lincoln died, during the Johnson presidency, during the Grant presidency. And Hayes was really the first president to try to move for move more power back towards the executive. Part of that was through the use of his veto. I thought he used the bully pulpit quite well. And I thought he really moved to protect the presidency as an institution. And then finally, the last thing, and we've touched upon this, I think it was with James Monroe, was the first president that actually did a tour of the United States. But Hayes took a 71-day tour of the American West. He was not the first president to go. I was surprised to find Grant had gone to Utah in 1875. I'd somehow forgotten that. But and his nickname was Hayes the Rover, or Ruth for the Rover. And I think it's important. That's an issue that we have talked about in terms of leadership is you've got to get out of the corporate headquarters. You've got to get out of the ivory tower. And for a president to actually travel and meet people, I think is it's always important to do. And particularly in that age uh, where travel is much more difficult now uh, than it is now, it was a significant effort to get out and get to the West. And he did that. And I think that should be noted. And that's a leadership skill that we can still learn lessons from today. Yeah. No, that's true. I agree with you about his efforts to move control back and more control back into the executive. One of the things about these presidents in general that struck me is how different the system was with the senators still being elected by the states. The negotiations were far more complicated, I think, than they are now. And the egos were certainly no smaller. <laughs> so it's, uh, I think he showed great leadership in getting a fair amount done and also in keeping things from being done that shouldn't be done. And I guess we should say a word about his, his personal integrity. I know you touched on that in your opening, but I think he does get high marks for high personal integrity. Yeah, and one of the things he said was that he, uh, he said his task was to wipe out the color line, to abolish sectionalism, to end the war and bring peace. To do this, I was ready to resort to unusual measures and to risk my own standing and reputation within my party and the country. And he did. He didn't run for a second term, which I think was part of the compromise that he had agreed to to only serve one term. And he lived up to that. So yeah, he was a man of great integrity, which is very odd coming out of this time period. In general, though, I think the United States was lucky in the presidents we had there. And I think Hayes is a good example of someone who's been unjustly forgotten. I agree. On that note, this is Richard Lummis and Tom Fogg. Presidential Leadership Lessons was recently awarded by the communicators as a podcast of distinction, and we're certainly thrilled to have won that award. Also, I would like to invite you to another podcast I recently concluded called Never the Same, which looks at business issues which have changed forever in the wake of the Russian invasion of Ukraine.